they classified this document immediately and forwarded it to some very prominent people. And they said that this document outlined that the entities that people were calling space aliens were not actually from outer space. The government knew in the 40s, according to this document, that they were interdimensional, not aliens from space, but that they were traveling through dimensions. Hey friends, Sean from SGT Report. Boy, you're gonna wanna buckle up for this one. It's going to be a powerful interview with my friend, Justin Fall, the man behind the movie, Higher Entities, The Lost Tapes. I wanna let you know that this interview is brought to you in part by the Patriot Charger. After a crash, every second counts. That's why the Patriot Charger's six-in-one features are designed to help you in unexpected incidents on the road. It plugs directly into your cigarette lighter, and every time I get in my car, I use the USB port on the Patriot Charger to plug in my phone, which makes it an excellent power bank. By the way, that power bank works when you take the Patriot Charger with you on the go as well. The Patriot Charger has an emergency window breaker, an emergency seatbelt cutter, a flashing emergency beacon, an ultra bright LED flashlight. Of course, it has that USB port and it's a 200 mAh power bank. So skip the Black Friday lines and get your Patriot Charger today. For those on mobile, just open up your camera phone and point it at this code and it will take you directly to the Patriot Charger. You can use promo code SGT20 to take 20% off while supplies last. I'll leave the link below this video. Okay, friends, let's begin. This is gonna be one of the most gripping interviews you're going to hear this year, I guarantee it. I love it when all things come together, all areas of research, the stuff we've been looking at for years and years and years. I think it's all coming together and it's gonna make sense after you listen to this interview with my friend, Justin Fall. The mind behind Higher Entities, The Lost Tapes. That's his new movie. You can find it on Vimeo. Justin, welcome. Hey, Sean, thanks for having me back on the SGT Report. It's a pleasure. Hey, brother, thanks for coming back on. Look, the last time I had you on was in April, actually part one, uh, Earth Chronicled. We posted that on March 31st. In part two of that interview, Spiritual Warfare, UFOs in Antarctica, that was posted on April 1st. And now you have out your new movie, Higher Entities, The Lost Tapes. It's on Vimeo. I watched the entire film last night. We've got so much to go through today, guys. This will probably be a two-part interview here with Justin. But let me tell you, this is the stuff that will help you figure out all of it, the spiritual warfare, the antichrist agenda, the alien agenda, the alien deception, it'll all come together here. How do we support you? How do people watch this film for themselves on Vimeo? Uh, I recommend everybody just head over to fourthwatchfilms.com. That's F-O-U-R-T-H-W-A-T-C-H-F-I-L-M-S.com. Fourthwatchfilms, all spelled out, .com. Right there, you're gonna see that we've got DVDs available. We've got streaming options. Um, right there, it's like a hub that'll take you to whatever area you want to go. If you want the DVD or if you want to watch it online. Hey, we, we all live in a culture of instant gratification. People want things now. So we do offer an HD digital stream. And that's what you watched last night, Sean. Um, man, this is crazy. Uh, th th this is unprecedented because um, like, I remember like people contacting me, very few people contacting me over the years to ask if I'd ever heard of this group, the Collins Elite. Uh, that's where this all began. And, and I don't know if I just should jump in. Uh, do you want to, I don't know if you want to take the reins, um, but well, let's, I'm sorry, man. I get no, excited. no, no, that's fine, man. I, I want you to be excited because this is, all right, let me just level set for people. So in your first interview in your film, you talked to Derek Gilbert and you guys talk about the Collins elite who were looking into the alien thing, right? What are right. these entities that are, people are seeing all over the world? And they believe, they found out that these are soul-sucking demons. These are not extraterrestrials. It's more likely the Collins elite believe that these are interdimensional. They're fallen angels. And Psalms 82, you know, in the, uh, in the documentary, calls them out. And so a big part of your film is finding out if this Collins elite is actually a real group. Did they exist? Right. So uh, let me just take everybody back. Um, First off, the Collins elite is a group that does not exist. To use official government language, this group does not exist. Uh, they are what's considered an LAP or an, uh, a limited access program. Now, a limited access program is different than any other program the government puts together because nobody in Congress has to know anything about it. Um, these things go on completely off the radar, yet they're receiving sometimes government funding that just magically appears. I mean, literally, they make money for these things. Nobody questions it. But hey, these are the guys that print the money. So, you know, who cares, right? 
They're, they're doing these secret projects. They don't exist. And then people end up getting killed. Um, lives get ruined, Sean. Um, and so we felt that we wanted to validate whether or not, you know, we wanted to see if, if the Collins elite really existed. And this is a group that was part of a bigger group that the federal government put together um, in the late 40s. And I think this is really important to note that we had in 1918, we had Aleister Crowley, um, and he was performing what was known as the Amalantra Working Ritual, which later got picked up by Jack Parsons and by L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology and Jet Propulsion Laboratories. Uh, they picked up this ritual. They did some tweaks to it. Uh, we have to remember Jack Parsons was a scientist, so he was really big into that scientific method. And so he was trying to scientifically get into the occult arithmetic of the ritual, from what I understand. They recreated this ritual, they tweaked it, and they called it the Babylon Working Ritual. It was in this ritual that was taking place uh, out in the California deserts. Uh, it took place actually over a, a number of years uh, until they finally claimed to have gotten it right. But what's interesting is that they claim to have ripped open a portal out in the desert on American soil, and entities began to come through this portal. What we could only call alien entities, uh, there was an influx of UFO activity, an influx of uh, entities, uh, what we would also call spiritual warfare. People were struggling with all of this stuff happening, and the federal government had to get involved because things were really happening and there were no answers, Sean. And so the federal government secretly creates this group and it's, it's a limited access program. It's a group that was going to find answers to what was really going on. Uh, they even went in and interviewed Jack Parsons and Jack Parsons, they, they said, were you responsible for this? Like, did you, the uh, portal, you, you're talking about the portal, right? They and wanted Parsons to know. Said yes. Parsons says, I think so. Now look, Jack Parsons being a scientist, he's going to continue to work and continue to work until he breaks through. That's what scientists do. They work and they work and they work until they either prove or disprove a hypothesis. Well, he says that they were successful and that entities did come through, specifically one that they really wanted to contact. And maybe at some point we'll talk about my film that we did last year called Belly of the Beast. We focus deeper on this ritual in that film. Uh, we don't have it available on our website. Uh, it, it, we don't own the film, uh, but we can talk about that another time. Point is the Babylon working took place in the late forties. It finally took, according to Parsons, and the federal government has to come in and investigate because now all these reports are coming in. Um, you know, the old saying, uh, a million McDonald's fans can't be wrong or a million Elvis fans. You know, people use this term with a lot of things. When you have that many people calling in and complaining or reporting things, the government has to finally take it seriously. Now, this group gets spawned and they're researching these things. They begin to look into occult measures. Uh, this is where the, the story kind of takes a twist that you have these federal agents. Uh, in the late 40s and the early 50s that not only realize that this is real and that these entities are here. Can we back up one second? I think we're, we're going a little too fast for the audience because if we dive right into the Collins elite, we're, we're jumping over a big core of the story, which is Parsons and Aleister Crowley and sex, blood, magic, and all of these rituals they were doing to try to summon these entities, which Absolutely. Christians, as some of the uh, in the Collins elite were, Christians believe these weren't aliens from another galaxy. These are, again, entities, interdimensional beings, demons. So let's just touch on that. Jack Parsons, who was he? How did he get involved with this? Those who've heard the name know he's the mind behind the founder, I guess, of Jet Propulsion Labs and the whole the tie to NASA. This is so much bigger than just one guy. This is an entire organization, NASA, built on this stuff to the degree that he was one of the founders of NASA. I, I guess without it, him, without Jack Parsons, there would be no rockets in NASA. Uh, I mean, he was the guy who was working on technology that the military saw and said, this stuff is never going to work. They said, so, they said, your sciences will never work. And he, here he comes and he works and he does these things with the knowledge that he's getting through his channeled materials. So our government now brings in this guy who's uneducated. He's untrained. He, I mean, <laughs> the story of Jack Parsons is so amazing and unprecedented. The guy was not even trained officially, yet he's putting together sciences and technologies that no one has ever heard of and that everybody mocked him for, yet he's tapping into these things and he's getting real science and schematics to make rockets that finally worked. See, now that's really interesting. I'm glad we slowed down because I didn't know that about Jack Parsons. And if we fast track to the end of your film, there's the whole question about 1954 and Eisenhower going missing for an evening. And allegedly, according to the family, he went to Holloman 
to go and sign a treaty with Greys. And the treaty was, yeah, you can do what you need to do, abduct people, do whatever, we get the technology. All right, so I've just jumped way ahead, but that ties into what Jack Parsons was trying to do, summon demons to get information, to get technology, to get right. propulsion technology, rocket technology. And now the whole deception, as I see it, is NASA says, oh, we're... <laughs> Well, again, I'm jumping way ahead, but NASA, as I see it, is telling us, oh, we can go all over the galaxy with our technology. We can put rovers on Mars, et cetera. And uh, I think it's all part of a uh, much, much deeper deception. So anyway, back to Jack Parsons. Why, how did he get involved with this? Did he know Aleister Crowley? Were they doing these rituals together? Did he learn this stuff from Aleister Crowley? The official story... And, and the thing is, is you're going to hear different ideas of, of how this actually went down. But the story that the mainstream is promoting... Uh, inside of Strange Angel. Strange Angel is a uh, CB. I think it's a CBS All Access show. It's got it's got nudity. It's got blood, sex, magic rituals. They're doing. I mean, I can't recommend the show for a Christian to watch. Uh, I, I've watched it. Uh, I've not seen the second season, but it shows some of the history, the untold history of Jack Parsons. Uh, very fascinating show. I just I wish they would have done it in a clean version. Um, but here's the deal. Ja the, the official story is that Jack Parsons uh, was living next door to a guy who was you know, uh, kind of addicted to the writings of Aleister Crowley uh, and the practices of Thelema and that that's how it all got spawned. And then he began to be the master of it all and that he was directly communicated with by Aleister Crowley as Aleister Crowley got older. Uh, but, you know, he was in charge of the branch, or he, he worked his way up to the branch of Thelema that was over there in California. That, 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 again, these are things that the official story, I can't validate these things because the official story may or may not be completely accurate, but this is what they're selling to the public on a major broadcast on CBS right now. So they're saying that Parsons got into it because of his neighbor, um, which very much seems to be in line with the, his, you know, the historical uh, account. But L. Ron Hubbard gets connected with Jack well, Parsons. That's the part you just can't make up. That's absolutely insane. L. Ron Hubbard. The loony guy who wrote more trash science fiction novels than anybody in the history of the world, evidently, and then founded Scientology. L. Ron Hubbard <laughs> and Jack Parsons were partial founders of NASA. Is that actually true? I can't validate whether or not L. Ron Hubbard was. Uh, we know for a fact Jack Parsons was. Matter of fact, a lot of people say that JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratories, uh, was a cover-up for Jack Parsons Laboratories, that they swapped it around a little bit. Um, it's, it's ironic to say the least that JPL is, you know, Jack Parsons, Jet Propulsion, but regardless, uh, L. Ron Hubbard was a protege or, a, a, you know, a colleague, if you want to, that's probably a more accurate term. He was a colleague of Parsons and a follower of Thelema as well. Um, and it's fascinating that this is a guy, like you said, he, he's a science fiction author turned into a religious guru who started a religion. That should be a warning and a red flag right there. You know, he's been writing all these crazy stories. But there's something that we need to go ahead and drop in on the timeline here. In the 40s, uh, there was a member of academia, very respected member of academia, who wrote up a document and he submitted it to the FBI. This was document 6751. Uh, I got to credit Chad Riley, a uh, co-producer of Hollow Earth Chronicles and Higher Entities. Chad Riley is the one that found this, this what we call an Easter egg. Uh, as he was kind of going through some of the documents. We have over 300 declassified documents, by the way, uh, that we uh, used in getting prepared for this film. And Chad finds 6751, and what happened was this member of academia submitted this information to the FBI. Now, look, the FBI gets tons of people nonstop submitting documents. You know, they've got people writing documents and warning them of this and warning them of that. So the FBI has to choose what's important, you know, what's legitimate and what's not. What happened was the FBI took this document and they classified it immediately. Now, that tells you that there's something to this. They don't just classify documents. They classified this document immediately and forwarded it to some very prominent people. And they said that this document, uh, this document outlined that the entities that people were calling space aliens were not actually from outer space. The government knew in the 40s, according to this document, that they were interdimensional or extra dimensional, whatever word you want to use. Basically, that these entities were not aliens from space, but that they were traveling through dimensions. Now, this was in the 40s. Okay, this is so far advanced for the 40s. Nobody was talking about this. And the document got classified immediately. Now, they also use some terminology that goes directly to the writings of Madame Blavatsky, direct, you know, uh, what, we, what we call 
um, theosophy. So if you study theosophy, then you're going to find out that there's terminology that's, that was written into this document, this FBI document in the 40s. So we know the government has known since the 40s at least that these were interdimensional beings, that they were not space aliens. And this goes right along with what Aleister Crowley said, where he said that today we're calling them angels and demons, but tomorrow we're going to be calling them something else. They're going to be posing as something else. They're going to have a different narrative in the generations to come. So Crowley knew this. Uh, the government knew this back in the 40s. Like th th This was just one of those things where if you were in the FBI, you knew about this if you were at the highest echelon of security clearance. So they declassified this document, 6751. You can download it from the FBI vault right now, and you can read up on this. So uh, they knew they weren't aliens. Parsons knew that they weren't space aliens. Crowley definitely knew they weren't space aliens. I mean, we're dealing with uh, all the way back in, I mean, 1918, Aleister Crowley's performing the same ritual, you know, with a couple tweaks to it. All of this is going on in 1918. That's, that's like a year before the Thule, uh, the, the Thule Society in Germany uh, really launched off. I believe it was 1919 when that really sparked and took off. A lot of things were happening spiritually. And that's one thing that we can see when we go back through history, Sean, is we can see that these major things that took place, major satanic rituals, it was not just happening in one part of the world, but it was almost like a revival that was taking place uh, in various parts of the world because Satan has his minions in high levels all over the world. Right. So I don't want to get too off track there, but the government knew that they were interdimensional, that they were not aliens, and Jack Parsons knew that. All of this was taking place in the days um, you know, leading up to this uh, limited access program, which the Collins elite spun out of. So I don't want to jump too far ahead. I'll let you kind of direct us. No, you're fine. I mean, my mind's just kind of spinning. And I guess, you know, for those who are listening, who wonder about the spiritual question here, I guess it's interesting to me that when it comes to science, NASA, we're not allowed to talk about the spiritual question, right? They've, what they've tried to do in this society is separate God from science, right? Spirituality from science. Science, science, science. That's all we hear. Trust us about vaccines. Trust us about everything. And if you question anything, you're a science denier. When in fact, if you go and you look at the foundations of science, NASA, you get to this occult, spiritual demon summoning, essentially, is what we're talking about here. And I want people to understand that because I think there's a very clear alien deception that is being used to whipsaw humanity or will be used to whipsaw humanity in the future into doing the bidding of essentially, well, what would you say? What is their goal here? What do they want to use this alien deception for? And I know I'm really jumping ahead, but again, if we go back to the NASA founders, Jack Parson and L. Ron Hubbard, using a ritual, opened a space-time portal, and before they could close it, before Jack Parsons could close it, he blew himself up. Right, right. That's important. He dies. And so uh, according to the literature uh, that they believe, you know, we have the Bible, they've got their writings and, and, and you know, their documents. Um, the belief according to their, their sect was that whoever opens the portal has to close the portal. And so he's dead now, a freak accident. He blows himself up in his, in his home lab and, uh, or one of his labs. I forget if it was, I think it was at his house. But what's crazy is that when that happens, it's like, okay, well, the portal never got shut. And we're dealing with some end time stuff here. And let me, let me just remind people, I think I said this last time we, we were together, Sean, you know, we're over 2000 years into the end times, according to the New Testament. To think that we've been in the, new, in the end times ever since Acts chapter two, where the apostle Peter said that the prophecies of Joel have began to be fulfilled. Um, so we know that a little over 2000 years ago, the end times had began, the official sparking of the end times. To think that we're 2,000 years into that right now, Satan and his minions, they have got to be up on the times. I mean, they, they've had 2,000 years of being, you know, deceptive in this, this, you know, this, what some people call a dispensation. I'm not a dispensationalist, but this, this span of time. So Jack Parsons blows himself up. People are a little bit worried now because the portal never got closed. And, and let's just be frank here. There was very few people that knew about this. Like when the government finds out this information, they don't just go run and tell everybody. They don't tell the local police. They don't, they don't tell your congressmen. Like, this is extremely classified information. They think they're protecting us by not telling us these things. But Jack Parsons knew they weren't aliens. That's so important to, to, to remember. I just want to lay that out again. These people knew what they were getting into. 
and that's important. That's kind of what I wanted to say, and I don't think I flushed out my thought very well, is that the elite have learned that these entities can be summoned. And when these entities are summoned, I've evidently they're willing to make deals with these entities in exchange for technology, in exchange for power, in exchange for knowledge, right? And so this all ties together with child sex trafficking and satanic ritual abuse in all of it. The new finders documents dumped from the FBI about the CIA's finders cult, which was involved in child trafficking and satanic ritual abuse and sacrificing kids. I think it's all part of a bigger picture. Now, when you were talking to Chad Riley in your documentary, now he's the one who found that Fed document 6751, he mentions the Council of the Nine, which the DuPonts were part of. The DuPont family was channeling these demons. So again, I just want to tie it together. When we talk about these elite families, when we think about the Illuminati, many of these families are involved in occult practices uh, because they derive power from it. And that might explain some of the negativity that uh, has controlled our planet for so long. Am I being you clear know, I, at all? Am I making sense at all? You are. And you know what, Sean, uh, I'd love to come back on and, and just do a, a discussion with you. Cause I, I've, you know, my background is uh, very much uh, in, in studying the Illuminati. Uh, there's a lot of structure and blueprints there that the average researcher doesn't know. You know, it's funny because I assume everybody knows this stuff because, you know, because I know it and I've studied it for years and years. I mean, I'm, I'm 36 years old. And I started studying this stuff when I was uh, 21. So, I mean, there's people out there that with, with great more knowledge than I, than I have um, and more years under their belt. But uh, at some point, I'd love to come on and, and talk about some of the structure of the Illuminati and their blueprints and how they're being fulfilled uh, with politics. That, that's a great place to go. Um, but just kind of sticking in, in, in tune with what we got now, yes, absolutely. They knew and they know that these are not aliens. They fully know that. And they know that these are the, that's why we call the film Higher Entities because they're channeling higher entities. Like they're higher than man. They're higher than the little demons. These are, uh, it's kind of like when you, when you see um, the New Testament teaches this idea that you don't just go uh, casting demons out of people. Um, if you just go cast a demon out of somebody and just leave it alone, well, that demon's gonna come back with seven more wicked demons, seven more wicked spirits, more wicked than itself. Uh, you know, Jesus taught us that. So it, there's a hierarchy of entities. That's, that's my point here. So with higher entities, uh, this is dealing with the ones that are actually working with governments, the ones that are actually setting up shop. These are the higher ones. These are the ones that have a long end game. They're, they're on that, that, that long game. You know, they're working that hustle over years, more years than humans live. This is a long game here, and I think we need to recognize that. now. Let's talk briefly. Uh, I, I want to get into this idea of how the Collins elite got sparked, if that's okay, because you have this group that the federal government created that doesn't exist. They're talking to Jack Parsons. They're interviewing him. They're researching all of these things. And they find out that these obviously are not space aliens, but that they're, you know, extra dimensional, interdimensional entities, and that they have brought information to Jack Parsons. You know, Jack Parsons was coming up with some heavy technology. And we know he was getting it directly from the entities. So there were these men in the federal government group. It's, it's not a named group, as far as I can tell. They began to try to contact these entities because they realized that they could be reached. So in order to research, to get answers for the government, they began to try to contact the entities themselves. This is where things get spun out of control because you now have Christians in this group that are saying, whoa, whoa, time out. You know, we started this thing off to get answers, and now the majority is trying to communicate with these entities. Well, Sean, they finally communicate. You know, we have stories now that there were blood rituals that took place inside government facilities. Uh, they were using psychic chairs, kind of like what you find out about, uh, you know, Stranger Things and, and, and the true story of the Montauk, Project Montauk. Uh, there, was a, there was a documentary called The Montauk Chronicles. I got, I got in touch with the, the filmmaker, Chris Garitano, fascinating stuff. I mean, the guy, the guy went out and interviewed people who were quote unquote surviving uh, victims of Project Montauk and very similar, uh, you know, very similar testing was going on with Montauk uh, that we find that the, that the Collins elite were warning, they were trying to warn people about these things that the government was doing this and they were making contact with entities and they were getting technology. You know, I thought they were trying to get answers and now they're trying to get technology. It's like, you know, this is what happens with mankind. 
we get a little taste of something and we take a mile. You know, you, you get an inch, you take a mile. That's the lust. That's the pride of life. That's the lust of the flesh. And that's what this group was doing. They were now not satisfied with just getting answers. They now wanted to be in communication with these entities. And the Collins elite, that was a small faction inside the group. They raise up with a Christian worldview and they get paranoid and they think we've got to create a theocracy in order to protect America from these entities. And so they were going to create a theocracy based on the law of Moses. Some people are going to find that real fascinating, by the way. This little group decided, well, we've got to, we've got to take over America. We've got, we've got to set up a theocracy based on the law of Moses, going back to the Torah, the Old Testament. And they thought somehow that that was going to protect the American people from being enslaved by these entities. Now, this is all happening in the late 40s, early 50s. This, is, this stuff is really getting crazy. Um, that was a time when Christianity was actually appreciated. You know, that was one of those times in history, in American history, where Christians were given a, a, you know, a platform to speak and Christians were looked at as good people. You know, nowadays Christians are looked at as, as monsters. Uh, the media has made us into monsters, but... Can I ask you something? As it relates yeah. to Christ and Christianity uh, and th that part of this equation, um, at what point does Greg Renrich come into play here, that top secret lieutenant colonel who was mentioned by Chad Riley? Now, according to the stories about uh, Renrich is that according to him, in these deep underground bases, uh, he witnessed 10-foot giants, right? Which I guess right. essentially are the Nephilim, who say they're ready to wage intergalactic war with God. But what was interesting about that disclosure from him, if this is true, is that in those underground bases, if you were down there, you had to sign an agreement, or apparently you, you could never utter the word Jesus, even as a cuss word because it has so much power against these entities. Again, that spiritual connection and the power of Jesus Christ. I meant to mention early in the interview here that your graphics package for your film here, Higher Entities, The Lost Tapes, is a nod to Stranger Things. And isn't, isn't it interesting to see Hollywood blur the lines with Montauk and make it seem like it's all fiction when a lot of this stuff is actually rooted in reality and history? So again, I'm all over the map, but the Greg Renrich question is an interesting one, and the power. Let, of let's hit that, but but let, let me just let me just say this for for your sake, Sean, and for the sake of the listeners. Um, it's hard to talk about this stuff without getting all over the map, uh, and, and and that's why we put together the, the the film Higher Entities so that you can watch it for yourselves because we're going in a bunch of directions here, uh, and we're going to hit on a lot of content. Uh, but watching the film, it's a little less chaotic. Um, because you can watch it and you can take the, the journey with us. We actually did this film in a different style. We did this film in a style of live action. You know, we had, we had people following me around with cameras. Uh, we did it like a live action, uh, kind of like an 80s documentary would have been done. Uh, just, just all live action going and talking to people in their comfortable personal elements. We, you know, we didn't set this up in a studio like our last two films. We wanted this like live on location. You just, you go, it's like guerrilla uh, guerrilla filmmaking. You just kind of go and, and, and do. And so with that, we're going to cover a lot of great stuff in this, in, in this discussion and in the next, but the film, it's going to be a little bit more, um, you know, in line. Uh, yeah. It's a little bit more linear than the way I'm doing <laughs> it. And uh, the, with a nod to your guests too, in the film, Derek Gilbert, Chad Riley, Tom Horn, Darren Gossinger, and Ray Boshe, um, all of whom are extremely, extremely eloquent. So you guys got to watch the linear version of what we're talking about here in the film. So go to Vimeo and just watch it. Higher, Ent but, but let's higher entities, the lost tapes. Let's talk about Greg Renners for a minute because this, this is great. And uh, we had every anticipation uh, that he was going to join us in the film. Uh, Chad starts breaking down some of his personal uh, testimonies that Greg Renners has given Chad uh, and, and others as well. You know, Greg Renners was talking to a few people, a few of our colleagues. He was in, in uh, he's actually was in close communication with uh, Kay Carswell, who's a dear friend of ours. And so we had every anticipation that he was going to allow us to come film him and, and to talk with him on his ranch. Um, the guy's got extreme security clearance. Uh, you know, you've got like Groom Lake. Uh, you, I mean, the guy's been there and done that. And he says that when you, uh, before you can even enter into some of these locations, you have to sign an affidavit. Uh, now, this is a legal binding document that you will not use the name of Jesus in the facility. And it's not just a matter of using the name of Jesus as a, you know, it, you know as a good thing, but you can't even use it as a cuss word. Like no mention of that name, Jesus. And so uh, that was a big deal. And so he knew he was getting into something. He knew there was going to be some, uh, some dark 
content that he was about to be exposed to. He gets down there and he says they're working with entities. They're working with some of these uh, are 10 foot tall that they're claiming to be the Nephilim. I mean, that right there, that's pretty interesting that these entities are 10 foot tall claiming to be the Nephilim. He's got a whole bunch of stories. Uh, you know, he says they're, they're preparing for an inter, uh, intergalactic war with God. Now, that lines right up with, with scripture as you study the end times. But the thing about Greg Renrich is that we were preparing for this. We were preparing to go meet with him. And he kind of goes off the, off the radar. You know, we can't find him, you know, not, not having contact. And uh, he finally uh, lets Chad Riley know that he's not going to be coming on board with this film. And that he and his wife were out walking on their ranch and that she started getting real sick. Now, he's already got history. The government has already attacked his family, destroyed his family. Like some of his family won't even talk to him anymore. Well, the uh, government showed of, up with guns, right, on his ranch. Yes. No, like but, men but in here, black type of thing. Man, listen, the guns, that's nothing. I mean, look, the IRS will show up at your house with guns if you owe so much money. We know the government has guns. I would rather them show up with guns than what they actually did to Greg Renrich. Uh, he and his wife are walking. She starts feeling really sick. They find a green residue on the back of their necks on their property. They're walking on their own private property off the grid, right? At least supposedly off the grid, but it's not really off the grid because you have secret agents coming in there and putting some type of a biological chemical, somehow uh, dusting them with it. And it's on the back of their necks. Well, she had a worse reaction than he did. His wife is now saying, you know, I think I'm dying, basically. I mean, that's the feeling she was having. And, and Chad breaks all this down. Like, we showed the timeline of all of this in the film. But uh, they were hit with some type of a biological weapon. Like you said, it's right in line with men in black scenarios because we've heard of people going and, uh, you know, the, the, their doorknobs will be dusted with some type of a, a, a transdermal, a transdermal powder or a transdermal gel that as soon as it touches their fingertips, uh, you know, it's instantly in the bloodstream. And this is so easy for, you know, these, these assassins to do to people. They can just get out there. They can brush a door handle on your car. And then you're, you know, you're pretty much out of luck if you go to touch that door handle. Uh, JC Johnson told me stories of this. Uh, some of his friends had this happen to them by men in black uh, out at Dulce, uh, Dulce, uh, New Mexico. It's very common that they hit you with a transdermal because it's, it's immediate. It goes right into the bloodstream. So anyway, uh, Greg Renrich, he completely backed out, you know, he mothballed any connection with us, said that we could include the story, but that he wasn't going to have anything to do with it. And uh, he is not talking. He is finished. So that was a major downer for us. But I, I praise God that, you know, Chad was able to, to give the story. And, and you know what? The other thing about this, Sean, is that by, by this happening, it actually just gives more credence that there's something going on here that the government doesn't want out. They don't right. want you to know these things, and they're willing to poison people and kill people to silence them. Well, and what resonated with me as you were talking to Tom Horn is that he basically warned you several times in the documentary to be careful because there are doors that you don't want to open. There are doors the government doesn't want open. And uh, basically Tom said there's powerful forces at work here. And he warned you at least twice in this documentary to be careful. You know, Tom Horn shared things with us, Sean, that he's never shared publicly before. Uh, now he, he told, you know, my brother Wes and I, he told us, uh, back in 2010, we were up visiting him and we were doing a little, little project that never went anywhere. But Tom told us, uh, some personal family stories off the record about, about his know, sister, Levita, about his sister. But, and some people, some people have heard little tidbits of it, but he gave us the full. Well, I heard it. Breakdown. I heard it in your film. <laughs> That's the crazy part is that I heard it in your film. And guys, if you want to jump uh, to the uh, finish line on this. If you or somebody you know is uh, being visited by these entities, otherwise known, I guess, as aliens, the best way to make it stop is to invoke the name of Jesus Christ, and it will stop, as it did for yes. Tom Horn's sister. Absolutely. And, you know, this film, it's got everything. It's got, it's got conspiracy. It's got aliens. It's got satanic rituals, blood sacrifice. It's got conspiracy to commit murder and murder. Uh, Tom Horn has a family member that was murdered who worked at Los Alamos. Now, again, these are things that he openly spoke. Now, Tom Horn, you know, he's getting, you know, he's, he's getting a little older and he's feeling a little more comfortable. He felt more comfortable talking about this, but these are stories that he did not feel comfortable to share previously. Matter of fact, he told his sister uh, that he would not talk about these things and mention her name until such and such a time. 
So the fact I feel very honored that he was willing to to let our platform be the platform where he finally revealed these these stories uh, in full. But I mean, you know, he uh, he had a, a family member murdered through this. The body murdered at Los Alamos by federal black, you know, what we would call black agents, black ops. I mean, this is crazy stuff. You just can't make this up. And we have records of all of this because. Uh, because of the the story where his sister was trying to get you know trying to get benefits from his death, she was trying to get uh, you know that was the sis- and- his sister Tom Horn's sister's husband, right? And this is the same He's sister. The one, he vanished from Los Los Alamos. I think after I'm you tell me according to your film, after telling her that yes, we are working with this alien question, we are investigating this. That is what we're doing. And two late two days later, he just vanished, never Actually, to be seen was, again. I, I think it was twenty four hours. Um, they, they're sitting around having some beers, you know, and, and man, like so many stories. I remember Ellie Marzulli telling me some stories off the record. And, and a lot of the stories start off with two people having a drink and one thing leads to another. And before you know it, you're now engulfed in some personal heart to heart discussions about aliens. And I'm telling you, man, um, Tom Horn's daughter, the same, I mean, I'm sorry, Tom Horn's sister, the same one that was uh, just tormented by gray aliens as a child. Um, I mean, just tormented by them. And, and he tells that story in the film. Her but husband. ironically, yeah, she marries this guy who works for Los Alamos. And then he says, yeah, no, what you're experiencing is probably real because we're studying this very subject. And then he vanishes. She never sees later. him again. Ever, ne- never sees him again. And then can't get a death certificate to get any social security benefits. There's no body. There, there's no body. So without a body, you can't get a death certificate. And so, you know, she starts rattling the chain of, of command because she's like, look, I, he went to work. He left this morning, he went to Los Alamos, and now he's gone. There is no trace of this guy. There is nobody, no nothing. And, and that, even the way that story plays out is more evidence backing up that this is very real because after she rattled the cage up so high, she finally, they finally said, hey, you know what? Let's just go ahead and nip this in the bud. We're going to give you your money and your benefits. Let's just go ahead and just never talk about this again. Yeah. So, you know, it all depends on how high up the chain you want to go, which can be very dangerous, by the way. Um, but you know, he tells some very crazy personal stories, even some of the stuff where they grew up, uh, some of the, uh, the, these massive holes, uh, just getting like drilled into these rocks, uh, with no evidence of any tools or workmanship, uh, just crazy stuff. But I want to make one last comment on, on the Tom Horn family story. Um, this didn't just happen to a sister, uh, and, and, uh, he actually, uh, he explained to us, and I, I don't think he actually used this term in the film, but he said that all this began. Uh, when she was uh, starting menstruation. Now, I, I don't mean to be gross. I don't, but but there's something in the occult world with sacrificial victims. Uh, there's some connection there. So you know, right as she would be entering into you know starting puberty, that's when the demonic attack started with the gray aliens. And that same thing happened to her daughter when she, when her daughter got to that age of you know puberty starting. At that point, she began to have the same type of demonic uh, visitations from these entities. Can I ask you something? Um, Absolutely. When we talk about Jack Parsons and we talk about Aleister Crowley and we talk about NASA and we talk about Jet Propulsion Laboratories, it's all very current, right, within our lifetimes or just a couple generations back. But when we talk about the pyramidal structure of the world and the controllers and the Illuminati, et cetera, do you want to describe for people what this Babylon working ritual is? Because according to Darren Gossinger, who wrote the book Zero G's, who's in your film, he mentions that the Babylon working ritual has been used by these people to open the doorway to our world for these entities. So it would strike me that the Babylon working ritual is probably centuries old. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I don't want to go into too much detail of what the ritual looks like because no, nor do I. But it, it's it's X rated. I mean, it's it, it's completely sexual. Um, you know, things that I don't even want to repeat. But I, unfortunately, what I what I can tell you is this: I've seen videos, uh, you know, R rated videos where they've done an R rated version, a reenactment of Babylon working. They've changed it a little bit. Uh, but th- there, people are still performing this to this very day. And that's where all of this information aligns with satanic ritual sacrifice and child trafficking and all this horrible stuff we still see today. And so if you tie it back to Aleister Crowley with sex, blood, magic, I think that's what you're talking about. What I'm trying to communicate with the audience is I think this stuff goes back centuries. It's been handed down yeah, generation and, and- to generation from generation to generation with these elite families. 
I'll just go ahead and drop some bombs here, man. Uh, this is just crazy. And, and listen, uh, when we when we need to start winding it down to start the next episode, uh, I, I hope we can get into on the second episode. We can get into uh, you know the the Stan Deo who worked for the FBI as a secret agent and Ray Boucher who was contacted by the Department of Defense um, to. I mean, I don't want to go there right now because I want to stay on track. But uh, no, let's but, do but, that, man. Because look, but, but I want you to drop the bomb and let's do that. Let's just round out this conversation. Drop the couple of bombs that you're ready to drop, and then we'll round out this. This will be part one, and then we will do a part two, because I think that this information is so important. If we break it into two more digestible parts, people can watch it uh, and maybe digest it a little bit better. So we'll Okay, let me wrap this up with some, uh, some Babylon working here. Uh, this, this is very important. And, and listen, some people, uh, you're going to have to really look into this stuff. I'm about, I'm about to say some things that are going to be very uh, discomforting. Uh, I'm about to say some things that are going to go against some of your paradigms. Um, Jack Parsons, remember how I said earlier that he was a scientific guy. He was very into the scientific method in that he said they were finally successful. He says that they finally breached, you know, the, this, this opening, this portal, and this female divine came through the sex ritual and that the woman who was out there with them, that she was impregnated as the ritual finally took. Their goal was to bring about someone, whether it be, uh, you know, some people have said it was supposed to be a man, but no, we actually have evidence that it was supposed to be a woman because it was, she was supposed to be in line with uh, the biblical theme of the whore of Babylon. Well, they actually connected with this entity called Hilarion. Now, Hilarion, if you look it up, you can find like, uh, like rend- you know, artistic renderings of this ascended master, Hilarion, almost like a transgender. Like it looks like it could be a man or a woman, Hilarion. But for the sake of their story, they claim it was a female entity, the whore of Babylon, the Hilarion that was going to usher in the Antichrist. Now, and they believe this. They believe that the Hilarion was going to usher in the Antichrist. So they do this sex ritual out in the desert, the Babylon working, which again, it's a, it's a, it's a new version of Aleister Crowley's, uh, you know, his working, the Isle of Mantra working. The woman gets pregnant and guess what? A year later, nine months later, sorry, nine months later, a baby is born. You're going to tell me it's Barbara Bush, aren't you? Hillary Clinton. Okay. That's so interesting. I hadn't heard that because what I was going to ask you about is have you ever looked at the connections between the Bush family, Barbara Bush and Aleister Crowley? I mean, this yeah, is oh, absolutely, absolutely mind blowing folks. Hey, look, um, Barbara Bush's mom, she was over in France the same time Aleister Crowley was over there uh, doing his workshops. Now, now granted he was kicked out of France. You can find the newspaper articles. Uh, but Crowley was over there majorly just, just igniting a fire of sex magic rituals around France that the timelines all add up. Now, uh, William Ramsey, uh, the author and, and researcher, William Ramsey, uh, he has documented this very well, that she was, Barbara Bush's mother was over there. Uh, she was close to Alistair Crowley and that she was known to be kind of promiscuous. Uh, she comes back, gives birth to Barbara Bush, and she looks stunningly much just like Alistair Crowley. Uh, there's even videos where Ozzy Osbourne is getting talked to by George W. Bush, and he says, my mom is a big fan. Uh, that video is on YouTube. You can look it up. But I don't want to digress. Um, this major ritual takes place, Babylon working, the portal gets ripped open. Uh, Jack Parsons ends up writing about it after the fact, and he says that they were in contact with an entity known as the Hilarion, and that entity was going to be sparked into an embryo during this ritual. Nine months later, Hillary Clinton is born. And I mean, listen, you just can't make this up. Hillary, Hilarion, the spirit of Hilarion in Hillary. I mean, the timing of everything. That's the thing. That's what's impeccable about this is that Hillary Clinton is, is, is right there. And listen, this last election, when Hillary Clinton was running, she was making it so evident that if she got elected, that she was going to bring full disclosure to the alien question. So there's a lot of really crazy stuff tied in with Hillary. We're not going to get into that. Uh, we did a whole breakdown of this in our film last year, and I'd be happy to come back on and talk about that film at some point. Uh, our films kind of all connect. It's like it's this big tracking of, of, of education, you know, yeah. our research, and, and they really do connect all prophetically. But that was the point was that Hillary Clinton was the child uh, that came through the Babylon working ritual where the portal was open and still is open, according to researchers. All right. Well, I can't think of a more powerful way to end this part one 
than what we've just touched on there. Because as I not so eloquently began this conversation, guys, what I was trying to communicate, I guess without saying it, so I'll just say it now, is that when you do the research into all of these different esoteric areas, including UFOs and the question of aliens, I used to cite the quote from Ben Rich, the founder of Lockheed Skunk Works, in which Ben Rich would say, oh, we have the technology to go to the stars. We have the technology to take ET home. Anything you can imagine, we already can do. Well, I bought that hook, line, and sinker. But now that I've done more and more research, you come back to the question of spirituality. You come back to the question of the alien deception. You come back to the question of, did NASA ever go to the moon? Can they get beyond the firmament? You get to all of this stuff and more. And I can't think of a better guest to talk about it with than Justin Fall. The movie is Higher Entities, The Lost Tapes. I can't recommend it more strongly. Go and watch it on Vimeo. Support the filmmaker. Share it with your friends and family. It's very eye-opening stuff. Justin, do you want to tease part two of this interview? What things should we cover in part two? Yeah, just really quick, I want to also say one more time, fourthwatchfilms.com. Uh, that way, if people want the DVD, and we did the DVD in, in a collector's edition to look like a 1980s uh, VHS cover. Uh, I'm, I'm an 80s kid. It looks like Stranger Things. But yeah, fourthwatchfilms.com, you can choose the format you want if you want a DVD, uh, if you want to watch it immediately. But you know, I, this stuff is so important in understanding uh, this great deception that is going to be coming on the face of the earth that you know, men's hearts will fail them with fear for looking, on, you know, looking into these things. Um, we, we have to be, as Christians, we need to be educated on the different, uh, you know, I, I don't want to quote Rage Against the Machine, but let me just quote Rage Against the Machine. They had a song called Know Your Enemy. And I grew up listening to Rage Against the Machine. And, and you got to know your enemy. You need to know the tactics of the enemy because, you know, we don't want to perish for the lack of knowledge. We need to be fully equipped. And part of being equipped as Christians is to know what the enemy's up to. You know, you don't just go into battle without counting the cost. You don't just build a castle without counting the cost. Everything you do as a Christian, everything, whether it's large or small, you've got to count the cost before you engage because, you know, we have been created in the image of God. God has given us so many blessings. And we're told that if we just ask for wisdom in the book of James, if we just ask for wisdom, God will grant it to us liberally. You know, we need to be asking for wisdom. We need to be praying in these hours, these, these last days. Uh, we don't know how much time we have, but we do know that God is bringing a remnant. He, he's opening our eyes and he's bringing information to us in this last hour so that we are not going to fall prey to this deception. Yeah. Well, as I've said so many times, the elite don't want you to know God is real. They know it. Unfortunately, many of them don't worship the God of the Bible. They worship uh, the fallen one. So, do you want to tease anything in part two? Give me a brief outline of what you think we should go through. We're going to be dealing with two men who have been either in the underground bases or working with Department of Defense. Two men that have amazing stories to tell, and that is Stan Deo and Ray Boucher. Uh, we are going to get into to their stories, the things that they experienced. And, and I've just got to say, I mean, you're dealing with anti-gravity technology, technology to walk through walls. These are technologies that the government was working with. They are receiving this information from the entities because, it, remember, at one point on the timeline, the government began to do these rituals because they now wanted to be in contact with the same entities that Jack Parsons was in contact with while he was alive. Yeah. So we're talking high technology. We're talking the deception of the entities giving the technology to continue the deception and trading with the, with the American government, trading technology so that they could have secret bases to work with uh, without being disrupted. Yeah. These are what we're going to talk about in the next episode. And it's unbelievable when you can actually see the faces of the men who were there. That's what we're going to be moving into. All right, guys, stay tuned. Our guest has been Justin Fall, Higher Entities, The Lost Tapes on Vimeo. Of course, you can go directly to fourthwatchfilms.com to get it. All right, Justin, thank you. Thanks, Sean. All right, guys, thank you so much for tuning into part one. Please give this one a like and share it within your sphere of influence if you did like it, if this information resonates with you. And it may just rock your soul, it should. This is the stuff they don't want you to know. As I said, uh, Ben Rich talked about secret space programs, Lockheed Skunk Works. I don't know, guys. I think it's more like secret inner space programs. The stuff they do and the entities they're communing with are not heavenly entities. They're fallen angels. All right, guys, thanks so much for tuning in. For real news 24-7, you can visit us at sgtreport.com, the antidote to corporate propaganda. God bless you one and all.
Bye bye. I think that the people at the very top、uh, know quite clearly that they're on borrowed time. We're one or two moments away from a massive public disclosure, a massive public event that connects and sends a shockwave through the world.